So uh, today we will finish the NMR morning session with our last speaker. Um, he is Dr. Christopher Lautzen. Uh, he is a professor in translational MRI at RS University Hospital. Now, he will show us a whole different side to how stable isotopes can be used with magnetic resonance. He will be talking about magnetic resonance imaging. So please join me in welcoming Chris. He's going to give a talk titled Translation of Hyperpolarized Carbon-13 and Deuterium Imaging. Uh, you have the floor, Chris. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction and for inviting me to give uh, this presentation of, of, of the work of uh, the imaging community. Uh, do you see my slides all right? Or yes. It, it, it's not? Yeah, OK. I see it. Thank you. Okay, so, so the outline of, of, of this talk is, is gonna shift gears a little. Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna sort of introduce how polarized carbon 13 MRI. I think a lot of you already know how that actually works, but it, this is this dissolution step that I'll be, be focusing on. And then I'm gonna move on to this new approach, uh, which has been spearheaded by the Yale group, um, uh, which is uh, called DMI as a potential FTG alternative, or at least that's what we're uh, focusing on in, in, in my lab. So just to sort of uh, recapitulate um, some of the uh, stuff that's been said before, DNP uh, is a way to, to enhance the signals and we're using that uh, in this method called dissolution DNP where we get more than 20,000 fold increased uh, signals uh, in, in vivo. Uh, it's, it's good that it's MR, uh, so we're not relying on ionizing radiation. We are using the, the, the fact that these signals, as, as, as you has been demonstrated uh, through the day, are specific to chemical structures. And that means that we can actually acquire more than one biomarker at the time. And what, what this talk is really about is, is this transfer uh, into human studies. And, and there's currently more than uh, a handful of, of studies going on around the world. And this is sort of the, the pioneering work coming out of uh, the UCSF group showing that you can uh, see, clearly see a, a huge difference in the uh, pyruvate to lactate uh, production or the production of lactate in, in a tumor, in the prostate tumor here. Uh, compared to the uh, healthy side. So this is our uh, primary uh, marker. So that's our FTG in the Kappa 13 MRI community. Uh, and that's uh, C1 labeled pyruvate. And as you can see, it, it's, it's uh, labeled here. And what we, we see in, in these experiments is that we, we, we inject uh, hyperpolarized pyruvate and that will then be transported to any part of the, the body where it will be taken up by the monocarboxyl transporters. And then in the cell cell, it can either undergo transformation into lactate or alanine via LDH or alanine transferase here, or it can be transported into the mitochondria where it can undergo a, a it can be spliced off and then uh, where it's going into the TCA cycle. And then basically we're seeing uh, this uh, this ratio here between bicarbonate and CO2, so bicarbonate here and, and CO2 is, is further down to the right. And, and this is the, the, the typical spectra that we will, we will get in vivo. So hyperpolarized MR is a radically different technique than our conventional MRI, where normal contrast in MR relies on the fact that or contrast agents uh, that could be gadolinium or uh, iron oxides go in and change the surrounding tissues with water. So normally we're only looking at water or fat uh, in, in, a clinical, in a clinical MRI. And then that is, is basically modulating the surrounding uh, protons by these contrast agents. But, but in hyperpolarized MR, we're actually seeing the tracer itself. We are limited uh, by this uh, by the longitudinal relaxation, so the T1 
of relaxation time uh, is a limiting factor. And we have roughly 60 to 70 uh, second T1s. Uh, and, and so that means that we're limited to fast anatomical processes like first order perfusion or uh, very fast metabolic processes. We are inherently uh, spanning a five dimensional space. So we have the three dimensions, the spatial dimensions, and then we have a temporal dimension so that we see where stuff goes. And, and, and then we have the, the fifth dimension, which is uh, the spectral dimension. So we see what stuff becomes. So just to sort of give you a, a, a cartoonish description of, of how the experiment works. So we have this big magnet that's typically uh, more than three Tesla. We have a freezer that's typically below uh, 1.4 Kelvin. Then we have the microwave uh, oven here, uh, which operates uh, depending on the on the um, on the magnetic field and the the substance that we're looking at. And in this case, we need a a radical, and then we we need a sugar substance, and that's typically this pyruvate. Then we we need to use a a way to get this uh, ice cube out of the system. And this is where this dissolution part comes from. And, and that's basically a, a water cooker. We place the substance and the radical in the uh, freezer in the magnet, and we turn on the microwaves at this specific frequency that allows this uh, transfer of energy from the electrons to the Kama 13s. Now then we, we place some water in the, uh, or a buffer in this, uh, Heater, and then eventually we will take this very hot water and pour it down on top of this ice cube. And then out we will get this green monster of a signal that is these more than 20,000 fold enhanced, which allows us to actually see these metabolic processes as they uh, unfold. This is how the original design actually looks. So this is a standard NMR system. Uh, where you can see this is the, the freezer, so that's the liquid helium, and we have the sample down here, and then you have the dissolution stick, and then you have the uh, heated buffer up here. So you're ready to do the dissolution, and then you pressurize this area here, uh, and then you, you remove the sample from this uh, reservoir to avoid uh, excessive heat load. Then you rapidly force this uh, stick on top of the, the sample, and then you dissolute the sample. So you're basically melting the, the little sample down here and, and getting this green liquid out. And this is how, how it actually looks. So this is the, um, the heater. This is the magnet. Now he's uh, pressurizing the system here. What you see here is that he's, he, he's uh, taking it all of the uh, bath. Now you see here is a green liquid. Now she's running, that's to, due to this T1 relaxation time, so you have to be quick. In this scanner, there's a rat line and it's now getting an injection of, this is C2 pyruvate. And what you see here is real time metabolism as it unfolds. And this is really the only uh, method that can see sub-second uh, metabolic uh, changes in, with, with MRI. Um, so this is a, something that's really exciting for a lot of purposes. And so this is from 2003. Uh, we, this is the first introduction of this machine by Jan Henrik Gardenker Larsen and the, the group in Malmö. This was then later on developed into a uh, sort of commercial product you can get, get from Hypers, Hypersense from Oxford Instruments, which again uh, recently had uh, sort of evolved into this uh, the spin aligner, uh, again uh, from Ian Henrik's hands. And but then simultaneously, so this was for preclinical use only and for in vitro use. Uh, but in parallel, uh, UCSF in, in, in uh, collaboration with uh, GE Healthcare developed a sort of version of this or an intermediate version that could be used for the, for the images that I showed on, on the first slide, showing you these uh, 32 patients were actually scanned with this sort of preliminary uh, version here. That was then eventually um, transformed into to the clinical spin lab that 
is, is sort of placed around the world and, and, and is being used for clinical studies. Um, and so worldwide, there are 24 of these uh, installations. And currently, uh, 13 of, of, of these uh, groups are now doing human studies. So that's quite a, quite a lot. And, and as you can see here, there's sort of a, a good spread of, of these groups. Uh, and, and I'm happy to say that we're, we're one of them. Uh, and this is our first patient. So this is some images from, from, from the day that we did our first patients. You can see the, the spin lab is standing here. And we had Jan Henrik visiting for this first, first patient. Uh, so the inventor of the technology. And as you can see, it's sort of a quite a big, uh, big turnout for a single MRI exam. And this is what you get, uh, at least also our first initial runs. This is a pancreatic cancer patient. And what you can see here is that this is a, just a 1D spectrum. And so you see pyruvate coming in and it's then being converted into lactate. So that's over here. Then you have bicarbonate here, you have alanine here. And so we were quite happy that we could, we could start seeing uh, this in, 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 in humans. And then already in, in the second subject that we performed in this study, we, we saw something quite remarkable. And so typically cancers uh, generate a lot of lactate, even, even in, in the presence of oxygen, that, that's a, a sort of a hallmark of cancer. And this is called the Warburg effect. And so basically what we're seeing here is that this pancreatic cancer is, is generating a lot of lactate and has a high uptake of pyruvate. So that's sort of in line what we sort of know about of these cancers. But then in addition to that, we see quite a high production of alanine or a relatively high production of alanine, which was kind of unsuspected. But if we sort of really look into it, it, it turns out that this is a specific hallmark of a specific uh, subtype of, of pancreatic cancer actually, where the stromal cells or the normal cells of the pancreas is actually living in, in a, this symbiotic uh, relationship where the, it's actually feeding alanine. So it's actually generating a lot of alanine to the tumor cells. And so this is a very specific genetic uh, fingerprint of the specific tumor. And this is something that has been uh, demonstrated again recently by the UCSF group. Um, so where are we? Uh, in this is sort of late to 2020 that we, we were sort of uh, looking as a community on the total number of patients that's been scanned and there's more than 600 patients now have been scanned. Uh, and it, as you can see, a lot of these are sort of related to tumors. Uh, a few is starting to, to so a few is non-tumor uh, uh, diseases like here's uh, some brain injury and uh, you have diabetes, uh, cardiac function. So there's starting to come other diseases as well. Uh, but as you can see, it, it's really uh, very much focused on, on tumors and that's because of this water effect, but, but more diseases or pathophysiologies are, are coming online as well. The really positive thing is that it's, it's very safe and, and, and on worldwide, no uh, serious adverse events has been reported. So it's really, really well tolerated. So it, it, it really is a really good uh, biomarker for a, a lot of different applications. So is there any alternatives that we can, we can try and, and, and look for? Uh, and, and another way of looking at metabolism could potentially be this uh, DMI method uh, spearheaded by the, the Yale group. And so they've demonstrated, uh, the sort of Robin de Graaf and, and his colleagues, has, has demonstrated that you can look at the uh, deuterium, and, and this is the natural abundance deuterium signal that you, you get in, in a person, and then you label it, uh, the sugar, you label it with deuterium, and then you can start to see after you drink it, you can start to see glucose uptake, you can see glutamine glutamate here and, and lactate, and then depending on how long you wait and, and, and if you have any diseases, or so, so you, you start to see these metabolic processes as well. So that's a potential uh, important uh, new biomarker. And then what you can see here is that they really quickly already in the first publication here actually went to humans. So when we, we uh, 
used uh, quite a lot of years to, to bring uh, carbon 13 to human use, where we, we were relying on these injections of these substrates, uh, they could actually demonstrate that they could actually go to, into humans already in the first publications. And, and what you can see here is that you, you see something very similar to, to a glucose to an FTG scan, where it's really difficult to depict uh, where the tumor is because there's a high glucose uptake in the brain. But now if you look at the GLX, so that's sort of the uh, TCA cycle flux, if you will, so there could be a surrogate for that. And then you have your lactate signal out here, which is the produced lactate from, from the glucose. And then they uh, set this very clever um, ratio up where you, you, you're looking at the lactate to glutamine glutamate um, ratio here, and you can clearly see the tumor is, is lighting up uh, very nicely here. So this is some uh, very um, exciting new technology. However, the problem with this technology is that it's uh, relatively uh, uh, sort of a, uh, the, the bandwidth of it, or the, the, the peaks are very, very narrow, or closely related here. So you really need to go to high fields. And so we, we asked if you could sort of take a slightly different approach and um, wanting to avoid uh, FDG in healthy volunteers, for instance, and in diabetic patients. So we, we're working with the endocrinologist here in Aarhus to try and, and just basically look at brown adipose tissue, which is a problem in, in Denmark to, to use FDG for. So we, we're asking, can we actually do this? And then we started out with this uh, animal experiment where we housed some animals at thermoneutral, and then we, we stored a, a different group uh, under at nine degrees for a, a week. And, and what you clearly see here is there's a huge difference in, in, in the uptake of these meta of glucose, but also it seems there is a, a quite high production of, of these metabolites. And this is how it actually looks. So indeed, uh, this experiment is very um, this glucose uptake is very dependent on, on this, uh, can be activated uh, by cold storage, that is, is well known. But we, we, we clearly see here that we can, we can use uh, 2H glucose as a surrogate for FTG, so we're avoiding uh, the radiation uh, problems that, that, are, uh, that we're facing with FTG. And so without actually looking at some of the, the metabolites, uh, we, we can actually depict this uh, brown adipose tissue. And that sort of led us to, to sort of move forward um, to the sort of the next question is, could we actually bring this to, to treaty, which is sort of borderline uh, on, on the average where uh, in, in a clinical scan, uh, 60 Hertz isn't that far. And so we have quite broad lines. So it's really difficult to sort of separate these peaks uh, from each other. We settled on a, quite high load of, of, of oral glucose. So, so this is 75 grams of uh, isotope labeled glucose with deuterium on it. We have an abdominal coil, but as you can see, we only have a one PPM difference between water and glucose. So that's very unlikely that we'll be able to separate that. Water and lactate is potentially observable. So that's a 60 Hertz uh, difference. So we, we did a, a, a porcine experiment first. We set up this uh, experiment with a chemical shift imaging sequence with as a very low resolution of 10 by 10 by 10. And what you can see here is that prior to, so this is prior to injection of, of uh, deuterium glucose, we, we, we get this signal and then afterwards we, we see quite a high uh, uptake of, of, of or increased SNR. And what we, we think we're actually also seeing lactate here. So we were quite encouraged by this. And, and so we actually continued into um, to humans. And so this is our, our first experiments in, in humans. And as you can see here, we, if we look at the baseline that that's, looks promising, you see the heart here, but then immediately after you, you, you drink this. So now we're, we're, we're taking the old road route and, and that is because we, we don't need a pharmacy then to, to fill this and then we don't really need anything else but a, an ethical approval. So this is a, something that is, is really convenient for a lot of purposes. Um, 
But as you can see here, the dynamic range is so that uh, we actually can't see any of the other organs because of the, the ultra high signal coming from the stomach. And then we, we did this experiment where we were looking at how, did, how does the, the SNR change in the stomach and in the other organs? And, and can we actually sort of use this to monitor um, when the, the stomach is cleared? Uh, and then you can see here, it doesn't really follow the blood glucose level. Uh, so you're back to, to normal here. So we're actually waiting. We have to wait up to around uh, three hours before the stomach is completely empty. And then we, we don't see any sort of contaminating signal from, from the stomach here. But then we, we start to see some, some very nice images uh, of, of the, uh, the heart here. And so just to sort of uh, summarize a bit uh, on, on this um, uh, talk, I would like to sort of emphasize that both of these techniques do not rely on ionizing radiation. Uh, the, in both cases, uh, the signals are specific to use chemical structure and we can separate them with, with uh, chemical shift imaging or other techniques. DMI is, is extremely simple to translate to human use uh, because it doesn't rely on, on this pharmacy production uh, in the similar manner as, as the uh, common 13 experiment. It is, however, limited by the SNR. Therefore, it takes quite a long time and you might need to, to wait quite a long time depending on what organ you're interested in. But it is something that, that looks very, very promising as at least a surrogate for FDG or in, in, in at high fields, certainly something that, that looks very, very promising for 70 and, and these kind of applications where you really get the, the full uh, spectral resolution that, that is needed. Opro SDMR uh, is certainly complex to, to translate to human use, but we're, we are actually there now. There's a, a, a lot of great studies going on around the world we get this extremely high increase in, in the SNR, which allows us to, to map a lot of additional information uh, that you simply cannot get in, in a conventional MRI experiment. And as I say, there's a lot of good clinical studies underway, um, but we're uh, quite, quite, a, quite far from in both situations from actually routine clinical use. Uh, there are 24 of these polarizers at the minute, and 13 of them are uh, now doing human studies. And with that, I think I would uh, stop and, and say thank you for, for your time and, uh, and for, for listening. Thank you, Chris. That was a very interesting talk. And, and um, are there any questions? Okay, I don't see any. Uh, I do have one um, with your uh, deuterated glucose studies with the deuter deuterated MRI. Um, it's an oral dose. Do you would you see would you ex expect to see any disadvantages or advantages if the dose was given intravenously? Yes. So so it, it's it's a really good question. I, I think um, so. The oral is is very convenient because you don't need to sort of apply for any special um, regulations and, and these kind of things uh, because it's then just sugar so that's why that that's appealing uh, but the intravenous injection is probably even better because that will i mean re reduce the amount of glucose you need um, for, for these ex experiments um, as well as ensure that you get glucose into the bloodstream faster so the endogastric uh, is a barrier and, and that will, will take time. So it's, it's gonna be faster to do the injection. And I, I, I'm certain that uh, this is something that, that people will be looking at uh, very closely, how to do this um, um, in, in the future. And I, I, you know, it's not particularly difficult to imagine that you can prepare these um, in a sterile way and then have them uh, delivered uh, already pre-packed as, as we get or current um, gadolinium and other conversations that we use. 
Okay, great. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, another question. Um, awesome work, Chris. If you double label glucose with 13C and deuterium, can you do magnetization transfer to detect on 13C for greater spectral dispersion? Uh, yes. Uh, it's it's um, so the, the problem there is is I mean in principle all these experiments are are, are are doable. The problem with most clinical scanners is that they don't allow that kind of experiment to be performed because they simply don't have uh, the capabilities to do much um, much I mean a two channel excitations or um, change between. Yeah, uh, readouts of the different nuclei. So it, it's that's a main limitation in a lot of these experiments. There has been experiments where on preclinical systems that are very much more closely related to the NMR field uh, that that has done uh, in that type experiments and uh, these kind of things. But but it's uh, something that's really really tricky to do on a clinical system. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, that uh, basically ends our morning session.